I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue Is, one of the fastest rising stars in the Republican Party, presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, one-on-one -on -one exclusive. Plus, co-moderator of next week's GOP debate, Brett Baer. The Issue Is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. The whole campaign is about defining what it means to be an American. Vivek Ramaswamy is rising faster in the polls than any other Republican presidential candidate not named Donald Trump. He's just 38 years old. And he's smashing opponents nearly twice his age with a younger style that includes tennis and rapping. Step back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. He's the first millennial to run for president as a Republican. The married father of two young kids grew up in Ohio as the son of Indian immigrants and a practicing Hindu. I've been racing my entire high school career. He'd become valedictorian of his Catholic high school earn a bachelor's in biology from Harvard, and a law degree at Yale. By 30, he'd be on the cover of Forbes after earning a fortune in biotech research. He'd drive towards politics after the birth of his son in 2020, releasing three books in two years. In February, announcing this on Fox News. And that's why I'm proud to say tonight that I am running for United States president. This week, he talked foreign policy at the Nixon Library, and spoke with us exclusively backstage. Vivek Ramaswamy, welcome to The Issue Is. It's good to be on with you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, congratulations on the run. Uh, Thank you. I, I know not that long ago you weren't even that interested in politics. That's correct. And then after the birth of your son, you got interested in it. You wrote three books, and, yeah. and now you're running for president. What makes you think that you're the most qualified person to be the leader of the free world? Look, I think it takes a unique combination in the presidency right now. I do believe we need an outsider. I share a deep skepticism with the likes of Nixon, with the likes of Trump, for the administrative state. So take someone coming in from the outside willing to shut that down. But at the same time, it has to be an outsider who has a deep understanding of the Constitution and the laws of this country. And I think I bring that rare combination as also a voice from a new generation. Young people in this country have lost their sense of national pride. I feel a sense of responsibility as someone who has lived the full arc of the American dream to pass on that American dream to the next generation. And I believe that I'm the best positioned person in this race to achieve that. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the state of the race. Um, yes. As we speak, we just found out on this day that there was this memo from Ron DeSantis's yeah, super PAC I saw that. saying that uh, he should target you, uh, essentially. What do you make of the fact that that's what Ron DeSantis's team is saying, target Ramaswamy? I think uh, the memo had some further choice words beyond uh, target, <laughs> but, but we'll leave it at that. I think that was the takeaway point. Right. What it says is, listen, I think that many professional politicians are threatened by my rise, and that's understandable. These are people who have been working in the partisan hierarchy for a long time. I think Ron DeSantis is an excellent governor of Florida and can continue to be one for the next several years. I'm going to need him in reviving this country. But I think that professional politicians, I think one of the things they often do is they attack other candidates as a substitute for finding their own message. And if there's one thing that I'm focused on in this campaign, it is delivering my message of national identity and national revival without apology. You think Ron DeSantis is scared of you? I think, he, I mean, I think certainly his campaign is obviously scared. That was what the 17 pages with, with a lot of colorful detail in that memo reflected today. It actually, I was, I was surprised, but you know, in some ways it's unsurprising when you think about it because they don't know how to react to an outsider that comes in as changing up the game. And so, you know, I don't blame them for feeling like they're on their back foots. Okay, so you're going to be on this debate stage yes. with all of these folks who have been doing this for a very long time. They have. <laughs> What's your strategy for debate night? I mean, if you want to take a look at it, the other candidates I understand have canceled their schedules this week and are doing debate prep. I'm in eight states in these seven days yeah. because my best form of debate prep is actually talking to voters. I don't like being in a cloistered corner office, getting coaching from political consultants on how many times I'm supposed to make a particular point or which lines I'm supposed to use to attack some other guy on stage. Apparently, that's how others do it. I think the best way to do this is to continue to have honest, authentic conversations with voters speak the truth, be uninhibited. I will be uninhibited on the debate stage, that's for sure. 
but I think that that's the way we've, we've been running this whole campaign, so that's nothing new. We don't know if Trump's going to be on the debate stage, but right now he's leading this race. And, and to be the king, you've got to beat the king. Yep. And there's, I know you, you say that you want him to be a mentor to you when you are the president, but there's yes. some folks that look at this and say, why not have both of you? Why not have him as president, you as VP, or you in his cabinet? What do you say to people that say that, that, that see, why don't you work with Trump? Well, I, as I said, I do expect to work with Trump, having him as an advisor when I'm in the White House. And I think I am the best positioned person in this race to reach the next generation of Americans who are badly disaffected, not only from politics, but from our culture, that are lost, hungering for purpose and meaning and lacking it. And honest to God, I don't believe that Donald Trump or really any other candidate in this race is going to be able to reach those young people in the same way that I am. The other thing is I think this cannot be a 50.1 election. It just can't. I think it's going to be potentially a disaster for the nation if it is. This needs to be a Reagan 1980 style, 1984 style moral mandate that reunites this country. And so do I believe that I would be better positioned to deliver that moral mandate as a vice president with Trump as the top of the ticket or with me as president and Trump helping me volunteering as an advisor? Definitely the latter. I'm going to be in a position to deliver that. And I think that's important. So your message to Trump voters is you get a better shot at winning with me. Winning in a landslide yeah. with me. That's absolutely right. And it's not just winning in a landslide. It is having the moral mandate to go further than Trump did with the America First agenda. Not just, you know, building the wall, which is important. I'll finish the wall. But using the military to close those gaps in the southern border. Not just putting Betsy DeVos on top of the Department of Education, but shutting it down. That is not a 50.1 mandate. Um, so you're here at the Nixon Library to yes. talk about your foreign policy vision. That's correct. How would you succinctly describe the Ramaswamy doctrine? Moving from the liberal hegemony neoconservative model to realism in our foreign policy. Put the interests of America first without apology. Be clear about it. That's the hallmark of our foreign policy going forward. I favor a modern Monroe Doctrine. The top priority of the U.S. military should be to defend the homeland. You don't mess with the United States of America on our own soil. You do not mess with the United States of America in our Western Hemisphere. And in terms of Ukraine, you have a very specific uh, roadmap of what you would do in Ukraine, essentially freeze things the way they are now. Right? I do. I would freeze the current lines of control. I would further make a commitment that NATO will not admit Ukraine to NATO. But in return, I will require that Vladimir Putin exit his military partnership with Xi Jinping. That, I think, is the single greatest military threat that the United States faces, is the Russia-China military alliance. I think that I will further advance our interests while ending the Ukraine war by pulling the two of them apart. Fitting to discuss that here at the Nixon Library today because it is a reverse maneuver of what Nixon did in 1972 with Mao Zedong pulling him out of Brezhnev led USSR's arms. I'm making the same move, except this time Putin is the new Mao. And the establishment, including in the Biden administration, is intensely focused on getting Xi Jinping to, to dump Vladimir Putin without success. What I'll do is the reverse of what Nixon did. I will go to Moscow and make sure that Vladimir Putin dumps Xi Jinping instead. That is how we win. A lot of the GOP base is actually with you. Uh, I think but a so. lot of the GOP donors and GOP establishment and a lot of the other competitors in this race are not. Yeah. Why do you think that is? It is a mystery to me. I have to be very honest with you. I cannot quite figure it out. I have lost donors, multiple potential major donors, over this particular policy position. And the tempting thing to say was, well, they have financial interests in Raytheon or Lockheed Martin. No, I don't think that's it at all. I think there's something more institutional with respect to believing that there's an era of holding on to our power that the establishment in both parties really feels like they relish but will miss once it's gone. And my message to them is, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. We will be more powerful if we are strong at home. And believe me, we're not today. Up next, we play personal issues with Vivek. But first, he plays the piano at the Nixon Library from Richard Nixon's childhood home. As we talk with Vivek Ramaswamy, on the issue of national security, you yeah. want to shut down the FBI. What happens when there's tremendous lawsuits 
How do you actually do that? There's two different questions. One's legal, one's practical. I'll start with the practical. My plan to shut down the FBI is actually going to increase the effectiveness of our law enforcement at the federal level. The 20,000 bureaucrats that sit in the J. Edgar Hoover building of the FBI, they can go home, find honest work in the private sector. The remaining 15,000 that are agents on the front lines elsewhere, now, we're going to reorganize them. We'll move some of them to the U.S. Marshals, which have done a much better job of taking on certain crimes that the FBI hasn't. The DEA, better at taking on the drug epidemic than the FBI directly. The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network for complex white-collar crime. This is actually greater specialization, which increases effectiveness. At the same time, it reduces bureaucratic rot, reduces the risk of corruption. And yes, I, as U.S. President, have the legal authority to do it. For example, under the 1977 Presidential Reorganization Act. Under certain narrow circumstances, one of them is whether a president is reducing redundant federal agencies. For the reasons I just described to you, I believe the FBI is redundant. That gives me the authority to act without asking Congress for permission or for forgiveness. Will we be sued? Of course we will. Yeah. Some aggrieved employees will sue, maybe thousands of them. We will take that to the Supreme Court. The current Supreme Court agrees six to three with me on this. That's how we drive change on the timescale of history. I want to get to know you a little bit better and talk about fatherhood. Mm. Uh, you, well, you talk a lot about the, the fact that family is yeah. kind of missing in our discussion right yes, now. Yes, it is. I mean, it, really, I think a lot, for a lot of people, the appeal of you is not just some of this policy stuff, but it's sort of the broader concept that yes, you're talking about. an ordering of what matters in our, in our culture. And I think that reviving the value of each individual, the family, the nation, God, that is what we are running to. That is what this campaign is all about, and, and I'm really grateful that we had a good chance to, to begin to talk about it today. Okay. <laughs> this is a game we play called Personal Issues. Okay. This is to uh, get to know you quick. This is rapid fire, the first thing Perfect. that comes to mind, okay? Um, what's your favorite TV show of all time? Ah, The Jeffersons. Oh, nice. I kind of like that. Uh, favorite movie of all time? Gladiator and Interstellar, both. Interesting. Favorite book of all time? So many to choose from. <laughs> Probably Friedrich von Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. All right. Uh, who's your role model? Hmm. Thomas Jefferson. Interesting. Favorite rapper of all time? Eminem, no doubt. And what's the best rap lyric of all time? Uh, a lyric. Hmm. Success is my only option. <laughs> <laughs> that Thanks, Ramaswamy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good really seeing you. Appreciate I really appreciate it. it. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> Up next, one of the moderators of next week's GOP debate featuring Vivek Ramaswamy. Brett Baer is with us after this. You see him right there. Fox News anchor Brett Baer is with us days ahead of this year's first GOP debate, which he will co-moderate. Brett Baer, welcome to The Issue Is. Hey, Alex. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, the debate is Wednesday at 6 Pacific time, live on Fox News Channel. Brett, of course, co-moderated the first debate when Trump first ran, got a lot of attention for that. What is the preparation process like for this one? You know, it's uh, it's been extensive. We kind of, you know, have been working on questions for a while. We haven't known who's going to be on the stage next week as of yet. Uh, currently, there are eight candidates who have qualified. We don't know if the former president is going to be one of the eight uh, or that it will be seven at this point. Um, and anything, you know, I get asked the question, do you think he's going to be there? I, I just don't know. And, you know, inside Trump world, we hear uh, different things and his advisors say you're so far ahead, it's not worth it. Uh, but the former president, you never know. And it's a big spotlight. So I wouldn't be surprised if he showed up. We know that the former president is projecting strength right now, but privately behind the scenes, you know, a lot of folks in Trump world. Is he worried about this? Is he worried about the, the real possibility of potentially going behind bars? Yeah, there is a sense, uh, and I've told, been told privately, that there are moments where uh, there's a lot of reflection about what exactly the former president is facing uh, if he were to be convicted on some, one, a few, or all of the charges. You know, you conducted uh, one of the best interviews I've ever seen with Donald Trump. It happened earlier this year. Here's a clip from when you asked him about Alice Johnson, who was a convicted drug trafficker. He pardoned after lobbying from Kim Kardashian. They were involved in selling marijuana, mostly marijuana, and she got like 50 years in jail. But she'd be killed under your plan. Huh? 
as a drug dealer. No, no, no. Under my, oh, under that, uh, it would depend on the severity. It would depend on the severity. How do you, as a journalist, go about formulating questions for Trump, who in a lot of ways is different than any other politician we've ever seen? Yeah, I mean, it is different. He's very unique. Uh, and in interviews, it's sort of like trying to nail Jello to a wall. Uh, but <laughs> what what happens is you study his answers on, um, on these things and you listen to his speeches. I have a great research team here at Fox. And um, as I was preparing for that interview in particular, he had been saying in recent weeks that he was really impressed with Xi Jinping, uh, who had the death penalty for drug dealers. But at the same time, I knew he wanted to out the First Step Act, which they ran a Super Bowl ad about, and Alice Johnson, who was let out. So once he said one thing, I knew that he wanted to say the other thing, and then I just followed up. Um, under his plan, she would be killed. Um, let, let's talk for a moment about President Biden, who is dealing with legal drama within his own family when it comes to Hunter Biden. A and you look at poll numbers recently show that the presidential race potentially between Biden and Trump is, is almost a dead heat. How do you assess President Biden right now where he's at? I think approval rating wise, he is uh, pretty weak. He is, uh, even inside the Democratic Party, you have upwards of 60% of uh, Democrats who are polled in a number of different polls uh, say that they wish he would not run for reelection. That's not a great place to be as an incumbent. That said, uh, he has an economy that is improving. Uh, they have embraced it fully by going out on the trail and talking about Bidenomics. So if there is a soft landing and the country economically feels better, his chances probably go up more. But the fact that he is tied, or in some polls even trailing by a point or two, to the former president who is now four times criminally indicted, facing 91 different charges around the country, tells you that um, this is quite something. This is a race that we have never seen before. And that our country is really divided and really dug in when it comes to the tribes as well. Um, all right, so somehow in your spare time, you find time to write books. Uh, let's show the latest on the screen <laughs> right now. It is called To Rescue the Constitution, George Washington and the Fragile American Experiment, which you can pre-order now for an October 10th release. What, what is the key lesson that we can learn from Washington in this moment in American history? And this is kind of a soda straw look at the Constitutional Convention, uh, the forming of a constitution, and then looking how Washington gets to that point. Uh, but the fact that the founders were so divided on some of the biggest issues, the fact that we almost didn't have a country, Alex, that we, don't, we didn't have a constitution because they were so embattled, uh, it gives you just a, a prism to look through about we talk about partisanship and how divided we are as a country. Uh, that was really divided. And that's really where George Washington was the founding father of all founding fathers. Um, he held the country together. So well said. Uh, you know, on this show, and I think it's your first time on this show, we like to have some fun too, and we like to get to know you a little better. So I wanna put up on the screen some pictures yeah. of you recently golfing out here in California at the Celebrity uh, Classic, and <laughs> that outfit is quite something. Anybody that was doubting whether Brett Bear is a patriot just has to look at his outfit. Uh, <laughs> you're quite the golfer, yeah. and, you're, and you're also quite the father. I know you've, you've uh, enjoyed a lot of time golfing with your sons as well. Um, can we talk for a moment about how fatherhood has shaped and changed you. Yeah. Well, first of all, those pants, you know, that's the only way the Fox guy can get on NBC golf coverage. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I just, uh, I wear those pants. Uh, it just became a thing. And I just, uh, I just did it uh, year after year. Fatherhood changed me. Um, my first son uh, had a tough start. He was born with five congenital heart defects. So we spent a lot of time in Children's National here in D.C. Uh, he had four open heart surgeries and 10 angioplasties. Um, he, it was touch and go for a number of these surgeries. So I really uh, feel for people who are going through health issues. He is now uh, 6'3". I look up to him yes. and uh, he is a big time golfer, plays varsity golf in high school and he's 16 years old. His little brother is 13, uh, but it has given me a different perspective and his fight at the beginning um, made me realize that you know, the bickering up on Capitol Hill is, is just noise and that there are a lot of other more important things that people are dealing with at their home 
uh, everybody's dealing with something. It may not be open heart surgery, but everybody has something in their life. So it gives you that perspective uh, when you go through something like that. We want to end with something fun. This is a game called Personal Issues. This is 30 seconds, rapid fire answers to get to know okay. your personal favorites. So this is the first thing that comes to mind, rapid fire. Okay, here we go. Put the clock up. What is your okay. favorite TV show of all time? Favorite TV show of all time, I'm going to go with Fantasy Island. Favorite movie? Uh, I'm going to go with... Um, Oh my gosh, I, this is a tough one because I have so many favorite movies. Hold on, uh, Robert Redford, uh, the pitching baseball pitching movie. Yeah, the natural. Um, the natural. Uh, favorite athlete. Natural. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Tiger Woods. Okay, and and who is your role model? You know, I think I have a combination. Britt Hume is my mentor and friend. Uh, I knew Tim Russert really well and respected his interview style. So I'd say I'd like to combine the two of them into one role model. You know, I ask lightning round questions. I'm never on the back end of them. I'm, you know, I just need to improve my uh, timing. Yeah, exactly. Well, we know you're also, in addition to a great anchor, a great rapper. Uh, so we always like to end with music. Um, mm. So here is some of you rapping, providing our music uh, to the Sugar Hill Gang at your show's holiday party. Brett Baird does it all from the pants to the rapping. You, you get the full package on the special report. Here's Brett Baird. <laughs> Take us to break. <laughs> Next week, conservative commentator Steve Hilton is here to talk about his efforts to rebuild California. We end this week with music and the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Mass Appeal sent us this clip from a Run DMC recent celebration concert. See you next week. Cheer, that's the real